Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be today. Uh, my name is Mio Lazarova, uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our 20th IHRM webinar, uh, where we have uh, Margaret Schaefer and Mihaela Dimitrova talk to us about Adjustment Reimagined. Before I introduce our speakers, just a few words about the webinar. As you see on our opening slide, this is a collaboration of six institutions, uh, Penn State, Penn West University, RIT Croatia, um, oh, actually uh, the Center for International HR uh, Studies from Penn State and ESCP in uh, Simon Fraser University, my own institutions. Uh, there are a number of people involved uh, and I wanna thank all of them. I won't uh, name them individually, uh, but email me and I can tell you who they are. They're all fantastic. Uh, this series started uh, in the middle of the pandemic uh, when we were looking for community uh, and we've created a community and we've continued to have those. We're very happy you're still joining us. Uh, please spread the word. Uh, this lives on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where we record all of our uh, presentations, including today's. Uh, so uh, Carol will put the link in the chat. So please go there, subscribe, share the news, share it with your colleagues and your students. Uh, this is where uh, we will post this as well, which is also a uh, note to you to say that this is being recorded. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, move to introducing our speakers, though they need no introduction. Uh, we have Margaret Schaefer, who's the Michael Price Chair and Professor of International Business at the Price College of Business at the University of Oklahoma. Her research interests stem from her own experiences as an expat in Hong Kong. In general, her research focuses on understanding the experiences of globally mobile employees with an emphasis on various types of global employees, global careers, and the work-life interface. Her publications have appeared just about everywhere, uh, like the Academy of Management Review, Academy of Management Journal, Journal of Applied Psychology, Personnel Psychology, Journal of Management, Journal of International Business Studies, among others. She is also an associate editor for the Journal of Global Mobility. We also have today with us Mihaela Dimitrova, uh, who is an associate professor at VU Vienna, uh, the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Her research interests center around global work uh, experiences. Her focus is on management of global employees, cross-cultural management, and employee thriving in international environments. Her research has been published in the Journal of Organizational Behavior, Journal of International Business Studies, Journal of World Business and Human Relations, among others. So. Thank you very much, Margaret and Mihaela, for agreeing to do this for us and for the IHRM community today. Uh, and without, mm, I've spoken long enough, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Mila. Thank you for inviting us to participate in this series and for your very kind introduction. Uh, Mihaela and I are both honored to be here and we're delighted to have this opportunity to reimagine adjustment and to hope, hopefully re-energize research about adjustment. Before we get started, I would like to just briefly review our agenda. So after talking about why we think it's important to reimagine adjustment, we'll elaborate on what we currently know about expatriate adjustment, definitions and conceptualizations of the construct, some of the major themes that have um, come up in the literature and the extant research. Mo much of this review is based on a project that Mahela and I, along with a couple of other scholars, are currently working on. It is under review at a journal now, so we don't want to say too much about it, um, but we're hoping for the best and we're certainly excited about the work that we've done in this area. So we will spend some time also talking about how we can move forward with expatriate adjustment research and how we can also move beyond expatriate adjustment research. So the next slide. For more than 30 years, expatriate adjustment has really dominated the international HR literature. So isn't it finally time to move away from studying adjustment? There are those that say we should move away from this topic. It's been studied to death and there's just nothing else to say about it. And I admit that I've been guilty of saying that myself as well. But having thought about this some more, 
and talking about it with others, we really think that there are still some opportunities out there for learning more about adjustment. And we hope to share some of those with you today. So why reimagine expatriate adjustment? Although adjustment is inherently an experience of change that does need to be assessed on recent expatriates and over time, both of those characteristics we don't see in the literature very much, most studies have conceptualized adjustment as a static state rather than a process of adjustment. As such, most have relied on cross-sectional data and have included expatriates with a wide range of experience and assignment tenure. Most of these studies have also adopted the Black, Mindanao, and Odu model of expatriate adjustment that um, was first published in the early 90s, 1990s. And that model focuses on understanding what the inputs to adjustment are. The bottom line is we believe that we're in a rut. Before we can get out of this rut though, it'll be helpful to review what expatriate adjustment is, as well as what we do and don't know about expatriate adjustment. So let's look at how this construct has evolved over the last 30 years. And we'll break this down into three different decades. So from 1988 to 2000, during this period, Scholars primarily viewed adjustment as a within individual process of making sense of an unfamiliar environment and reducing uncertainty. Black and his colleagues defined adjustment as a psychological state of comfort, and they identified three distinct dimensions, work adjustment, interaction adjustment, and that's specifically interactions with host country nationals, as well as adjustment to the general cultural environment. A group of other scholars, Ward and colleagues, differentiated between psychological and sociocultural adjustment. So psychological adjustment, which is the black and colleague approach to adjustment really refers to well-being, while sociocultural adjustment has to do with the ability to fit in and to navigate a new environment. So that dominated that period of time. Then from about 2001 to 2010, um, during this period, Harrison and colleagues distinguished between the state of adjustment and the process of adjustment which is the process of altering one's behavior to fit with the environment. Despite this distinction between a state and a process, however, most scholars have continued to view adjustment as a state. During this time period also, scholars began to criticize the early definitions and oper operationalizations of adjustment. For example, the traditional measure of interaction adjustment contains items that span both the work and non-work contexts. These early definitions also suffer from lack of a strong theoretical foundation. And there's some items also include a behavioral competence dimension, which really is an outcome rather than part of the content of adjustment. Some attempts to address these deficiencies include work by Mila Lazarova and her colleagues who redefined adjustment in terms of adjustment to redefined work and family roles. Another group of scholars, uh, Farr and her colleagues, focused on adjustment in terms of the development of social networks. So during this period, we did start to see scholars moving away from the traditional conceptualization of adjustment. But then in the um, third decade, where we are currently, during this period, many scholars still continued to base their work on the Black et al. model and their oper operationalization. And there's good reason for that in that, that there is a lot of evidence supporting their model. Um, but nevertheless, critiques have continued. In response to these critiques, some scholars have introduced different perspectives on adjustment and different measures as well. Schaefer and colleagues adopted a role-based perspective of adjustment, and they defined and measured it in terms of an affective response to the roles that expatriates take on 
in both the work and the family domains. Hasselberger and colleagues also offered a different perspective by conceptualizing adjustment in terms of fit across both work and non-work domains. From this perspective, they defined adjustment as a state in which the expatriates' cognitions, feelings, and behaviors become congruent with the norms and expectations in the host environment. And they later then moved away from viewing this as a state and also elaborated on a PE fit process. And then finally, Hippler and his colleagues defined adjustment as a psychological construct referring to the harmony that is the satisfaction or the comfort within the person environment relationship. And they developed a scale to measure both the significance and the appraisal of changes in the work and non-work environments as well. So that gives you a brief overview of what adjustment is. And next, Mihaela will review what we have learned about expatriate adjustment over the last three decades. Hey, thank you, Margaret. Um, so I'll continue with the topics in terms of theoretical developments and empirical developments as well, so that we move on to what we think um, should be the future of adjustment. So again, very briefly, starting from the first decade, um, there was a proliferation of studies uh, starting from that point uh, based on the black um, et al. model, studying work, non-work and individual factors. Attention was also placed on the role of the spouse in facilitating expatriate adjustments. So we started considering family members as well as inputs to the spouse's own adjustment. In terms of methodologies, we see mostly quantitative studies. Those were almost exclusively cross-sectional studies some multi-source data was collected on expatriate spouses, which was great for this time period. Then in the next decade, there were reviews and meta-analysis that indicated support for the black at all model. Future studies tended to focus more on the stressor stress paradigm. It was expanded a bit to include coping strategies, organizational support. Here I'm just listing all the different factors that we have studied. Um, I won't go into too much detail. We have studied individual attributes. How do different personality characteristics of expatriates relate to adjustment, past international experience of expatriates, and crossover and spillover processes, which was quite interesting for this time, um, between the family um, domain and the expatriate work domain and many others. Self-initiated expatriates at this point were really starting to be recognized as a distinct uh, form uh, of expatriation, distinct from corporate expatriates. And we continue focusing more on the role of stakeholders up until this point, there was more of a focus on the spouse. Um, in this decade, we have a focus also on um, local employees and post-country nationals and how they can support the expatriate in achieving adjustment. Now, in terms of methodologies here, again, mostly quantitative approaches. Now, when I say that there are mostly quantitative approaches, I mean in the most influential studies for that time period. Of course, we have qualitative studies as well from this time period, but this what I show here is mostly the most influential ones. There was some improvement in terms of data collection in collecting multiple time points, but this was really two time points um, at most and the inclusion of multiple stakeholders. So the point of view of also um, host country nationals. Then in the last decade, we see new perspectives emerging. We see the examination of adjustment through a motivation perspective, and also some studies on the influence of flow on expatriates engagement and adjustment. 
established topics continue. We continue focusing on self-initiated expatriation even more at some point than corporate expatriation. The work-family interface is, again, a topic, role of post-country national personality characteristics, etc. During this time, now we see a handful of studies that really had a longitudinal approach, and I'll talk a bit more about true studies um, and also Reiche, but we see a handful of those longitudinal studies at this point. So where we start to study a process of adjustment. Now, considering all these developments, what can we do to move forward with expatriate adjustment? We believe that it is not studied to death. What is studied to death is the factors that contribute to an increase or decrease in expatriate adjustment. We have identified a multitude of factors um, that could have some effect on adjustment. What we don't understand is the how question. We don't really understand at this point the process, even though the initial Black and colleagues model talked about a process, we kind of stopped studying the process. So what can we do to move forward? Um, before I talk about dynamics, dynamic models of change, I'll Give an example of what we do up until now and what we consider to be a process model. We think of a process model as this mediation model of boxes and arrows. And we think of it as being collected at multiple time points. And this is a process and we test the process. But this is not a dynamic process. And to illustrate this, I'll actually use one of our papers. I decided I need to use one of our, our papers instead of someone else's to illustrate how something is not a dynamic process. So this is a human relations paper that uh, Margaret Miller and I and a bunch of other colleagues published in human relations last year. And we studied the process. And this was a process of crossover and spillover in the work family interface for the expatriate. And while we studied processes, and we had data from two time points and from multi multiple sources, so from the spouse and the expatriate. We also controlled for past levels of expatriate engagement in this case. It is still not a dynamic process. Even though we moved a step closer to a dynamic process, it is not a test of a dynamic process. Now, then what is a dynamic process model and where can we start from? We're not the first one to talk that we need dynamic process model tested and empirically assessed in the expatriate management literature. This has been talked about for decades. Um, Haselberger's uh, model of PFIT also talked about the dynamic process model um, but we really, the lack of testing, the lack of empirical assessment leads to somewhat limited theorizing in this sense. The only study that we could find in terms of dynamic changes in adjustment that is actually of recent expatriates as well, and it tests essentially a trajectory of adjustment is the Joatau study that I mentioned earlier. Um, they analyze how the trajectory of expatriate adjustment changes over time, and those are within individual changes, and also how that trajectory depends on initial levels of expatriate adjustment on other factors, such as core self-evaluations of expatriates and past work experience. Um, we don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel. And the reason for this is that there are other disciplines that, again, for decades, have studied dynamic models of change. So we can actually look towards them for a bit of inspiration. And this is what Margaret and I have done in the study that she mentioned. We specifically looked at the literature of organizational newcomers for inspiration as they have also focused on adjustment of how organizational outsiders or so newcomers 
um, become insiders. So this is the literature in organizational behavior. This focuses on domestic employees. They have done a lot in the past decades of studying change, uh, both theoretically and empirically. Um, they have focused on the inherently social nature of the adjustment process and also um, that it is proactive on the side of the newcomer. That the newcomer has to engage in certain proactive behaviors to adjust instead of just reacting to the environment. It is very much focused on examining change trajectories. So this is very dynamic. And I'll give you some examples here just as an inspiration, as I said. Um, here is a study by Kama Mueller colleagues in 2013, um, and I'll show you their model where you can see that they actually test how trajectories, how changes in supervisor support, uh, coworker support, and undermining from those two groups um, actually change in time, and that change in time affects expatriates' proactive behaviors, uh, not expatriates, newcomers' proactive behaviors, and, and their adjustment over time based on different adjustment indicators. So what we can do with this type of dynamic models, and these are latent growth models and other types of tests, uh, we can actually see how dynamic changes in one variable influence dynamic changes in adjustment. Um, here is another example. Um, Again, from the newcomer organizational newcomers literature, jumpstarting the socialization experience from day one. Here, they look at trajectories of adjustment indicators and how those are influenced by the resources that newcomers get at the first day on the job. Um, so whether they have had interaction with their supervisor, for example, on the first day. So we can do this kind of um, examinations as well. We can also check for whether initial levels of expatriate adjustment influence subsequent trajectory changes of adjustment. So there is a lot we can do by looking for inspiration in other literatures. And an organizational newcomer literature is not the only one. There are others that also study processes that we can learn from. Of course, it is important to keep in mind that the context of expatriation is different and we can't simply transfer insights from this other literatures to expatriation. We do need to actually do our own empirical research. And now Margaret will continue with uh, telling us more about how can we move beyond studying expatriates and expatriate adjustments. Thank you, Mihaela. You provided us with a lot of good suggestions about how we can move forward with expatriate adjustment research. Uh, we also believe that there are opportunities to move beyond expatriate adjustment. In particular, the whole landscape of global work arrangements has changed and it'll continue to evolve. While traditional expatriate assignments are still common, their use is projected to decline in favor of more self-initiated expatriate expatriation and greater numbers of foreign employees hired on local contracts. Virtual global mobility is also likely to completely upend the way in which traditional global employees work. Expanding our conceptualization of adjustment to other types of global workers, such as frequent international business travelers, short-term assignees, global virtual team members, remote global managers, as well as immigrants, raises some intriguing questions. For example, compared with the traditional corporate or even self-initiated expatriates, international business travelers and short-term assignees spend less time in a foreign culture and often visit multiple countries. Under such conditions, are different proactive behaviors needed? Do such employees experience more uncertainty and less organizational support? 
And how are family members of these more transient expatriates affected? In many cases, the families remain in the home country, but how is there, how is how are they influenced by the movement of their spouse? Um, immigrants, on the other hand, tend to relocate to a new country on a permanent basis, and often with their family, at least their immediate family members. So their adjustment process is more likely to cross over and even affect that of their children. So we do see a lot of literature on second gen generation immigrants, for example. In the expatriate literature, um, the main focus has been on expatriates. Although host country nationals may not have a global role in the organization, they've generally been recognized as an important source of, its, of support and information for expatriates. But given the change in their work context and the sudden diverse culture, work culture that they um, experience, they also have to adapt. Um, and in many cases, they have to work with expatriates from multiple countries, which complicates their adjustment to a culturally diverse workplace. It's also important to recognize that it's not only global employees who have to adapt to a global environment. Globally mobile employees actually make up only about three and a half percent of the world's population. So while it seems like a lot when we're doing research in this area and based on all the research that's been done, it's really a very small percentage of the world's population. But globalization and its effect is not limited to globally mobile employees. Globalization reaches around the world to influence all of us. To address this larger need for adjustment to the forces of globalization, my colleague Victor Lau and I looked at the adjustment of domestic employees to the forces of globalization. Here, in this paper that's um, cited there that was recently published in AMR, we argue that domestic employees may also suffer from culture shock stemming from the environmental stressors associated with globalization. In many ways, this can be more challenging than the culture shock that expatriates experience because expatriates anticipate those um, the shocks that they're going to experience. Whereas domestic employees, globalization impinges on them and oftentimes catches us unaware of what's happening. So how do domestic employees adjust to their altered environment where what was once familiar has now become unfamiliar? In other words, we can think of domestic employees as local expatriates. They're caught up in the globalization process, even though they have never left home. So in this um, study, which is a theoretical paper, we integrated Hot Falls conservation of resources theory with Barry's theory, theorizing about acculturation at both the individual and organizational levels. And we introduced a typological process model to explain domestic employees' responses to the um, acculturation stress that they experienced stemming from the We view the adjustment of domestic employees as an adaptation process, whereby domestic employees adapt to the stress of the organization. This is the model that we presented. It's a, really a model of acculturation stress and adaptation. Um, a key feature of this model that I think is relevant, especially to the expatriate literature, is that we address the adaptation approaches of both individual employees, as well as the adaptation cultures of organizations. So we focus not only on the agency of the individual, um, but also on the context in which they work. This extended lens moves beyond that focus on individuals and recognizes that our organizations are also affected by globalization and they change as well as individuals. 
While we don't have time to go into this model in more detail, I would like to point out that our inclusion of the adaptation cultures of organizations um, does have implications for the expatriate literature and maybe a way to move um, beyond just the individuals involved. So to conclude, we've We've gone through a lot of information here. We've covered a lot of literature over the past 30 years and to hopefully further inspire people to move beyond um, what we currently conceptualize expatriate adjustment to be and to move beyond expatriate adjustment. We'd like to share some alternative research questions with you. First set of questions focus on the process of adjustment. They recognize a wider range of stakeholders that include host country nationals, other expatriates, as well as family members. So for example, do expatriates use different proactive behaviors depending on who they seek to approach? You know, when they're interacting with supervisors or with host country nationals outside the organization, do they behave differently? As time passes, do expatriates decrease their proactive behaviors? It may be that they find that the proactive behaviors that worked effectively for them in their home country are not effective in the host country. Do they modify those um, so they fit the local context or do they give up in terms of being proactive? What type of support and assistance are organizational and host country actors most likely to provide in response to the proactive behaviors of expatriates? Are some actors or stakeholders more inclined to help them than others? For example, are there other expatriates or are there host country nationals who provide the most support? Are they the peers or their supervisors? And also the family is critical as we know and do the family actors engage in proactive behaviors themselves to adjust to the host country? Uh, that would include both spouses as well as children that might accompany expatriates. What would these proactive behaviors be? What's going to benefit a spouse or a child who doesn't have that work environment to adjust to? Who are the most likely targets of their behaviors and how do their proactive behaviors influence those of the um, expatriate. So all of these could, would be really interesting to look at in terms of a dynamic process that plays out over time, starting from when they first arrive in the host country, and especially during the first few months and beyond that they're there. We think it's also um, important to continue looking at some of the stable factors that influence the dynamic process of adjustment. These factors encompass the individual, the organization, as well as the greater host country context. So are there other personal factors that we're not aware of, um, such as other personality factors, core self-evaluations, prior in international experience or cultural intelligence that really help net expatriates to navigate their interactions with host country actors and to make sure that their proactive behaviors achieve their intended goals. Is it more difficult for certain groups of expatriates? There's been some research on women, uh, much less research on disadvantaged minorities as expatriates, but do these groups um, struggle to proactively approach others in and outside of work? Will their proactive behaviors be less effective in, in achieving their desired goals? And do they face greater external barriers to remaining authentic to who they are instead of needing to conform? And finally, how do institutional differences in the economic and legal and cultural systems affect the proactivity of expatriates? For example, do expatriates from a country that sanctions corruption and other misbehaviors struggle more to adjust in countries that are more prone to corruption and other forms of behavior? And what about sex discrimination as well? How does that um, play out? and influence their behaviors also. 
So those are just some of the questions that we wanted to share with you. And we hope that these will um, also inspire you to think about other avenues of research so that we can continue um, this stream of literature and hopefully make it um, continue to make it meaningful and an important area of research. So Mahela and I would like to thank you. And if you have any questions for us, we will be happy to take those at this time. Thank you very much, Margaret and Mihaela, for this uh, very insightful and very dense presentation. I could just imagine uh, if I was a PhD student, I'd just you know take screenshots of the questions. I'll be like, <laughs> okay, that's 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 my dissertation. Uh, but actually, let me. Uh, we uh, questions are starting to roll in, and I want to encourage our audience to uh, to. Um, use the opportunity of having you here as experts on the topic and ask you questions. Uh, but I just mentioned PhD students. If I was a PhD student, I wish I were, uh, and I came to you for advice and I said, do I want to go into adjustment? Would you suggest that I study that? What would be your suggestion to me and why? I think if you study it from the perspective that we're um, introducing here in terms of looking at it as a process, um, that would be certainly very beneficial. The only challenge that I see as a PhD student taking that approach is that it takes time to look at things over time. And PhD students don't always have that luxury of time. So unless they really begin early on in their career thinking in terms of in their career as a PhD student, thinking in terms of this as their dissertation, uh, I think that they would struggle to complete a dissertation mm -hmm. um, on that topic. They could look at some of the other more stable factors and I think look at also from an organizational lens. Uh, Mahela, you have any? I do actually. I, I, I think while they won't be able to collect data longitudinally over several months, we have other uh, very longitudinal methods that can happen within weeks. Uh, the experience sampling methodology where you collect data every day or every week, it can happen in a short time frame. So I think it could be suitable for a dissertation as well. And while we can study slower changes, there can be changes in emotions and reactions in terms of certain behaviors and how we interact with other actors and how this affects us. So this could be studied in a shorter time frame, And I think it can be quite exciting for PhD students. I would do it if I was PhD students. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, that's exciting. So definitely uh, opportunities there. And I wanted to ask you if you think the challenge that you've observed uh, when reviewing the literature, is it theoretical or methodological or is it both? What is the biggest barrier to, to proceeding to study adjustment the way you suggest is a dynamic, uh, in a dynamic fashion? Uh, can I? Uh, I'll start with this. Um, it is a challenge that is empirical and it results in theoretical challenges. Mm -hmm. The theory developments are very tightly linked to the empirical developments. And we can't really move forward with theoretical developments if we don't start testing those theories and expanding them and really making them into dynamic theories. Um, I think it is not an empirical challenge per se, because we have, in terms of quantitative studies, they are analysis that can be used for dynamic studies, such as, uh, such as um, latent curve modeling and other kind of dynamic analysis. It is the data collection. And we keep talking yes. that the, the data collection is hard. And Margaret and I are actually engaged in another study where we do this kind of longitudinal data collection over a period of time. Um, and what I found to be the hardest is actually convincing companies that when we say that we are looking at expatriates, we don't just look at corporate expatriates. So when I approach companies, I ask them, send me, send this survey to your expatriates and all foreign employees, they mm -hmm. don't recognize the other foreign employees. And I, I seem to not be able to communicate this to them that anyone that they get uh, is undergoing a process of adjustment that comes from a different country. And if they just identify corporate expatriates, of course, those will be fewer. But if we expand yeah. and we really communicate this 
to uh, organizations and start making partnerships about it, I think we will have much easier time because the organizational newcomer literature does this. They partner with organizations to get a cohort of new coming employees. And so we need to do similarly. Wonderful. Thank you. Margaret? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would just like to add to that and also to pick up on your previous um, question about PhD students as well. One thing we haven't talked about that much um, in this presentation is qualitative research. Um, most of the research on expatriation has been more quantitative in nature, but I think there is still definitely room for more qualitative studies and those could lend themselves very well to looking at changes over time with expatriates. Okay and also provide a reasonable um, basis, I think, for a dissertation as well. And also that approach could help us to dig deeper into more theorizing about adjustment. Okay. Well, as a lifelong skeptic, I'm very uh, happy to hear optimism uh, in everything <laughs> you're saying. It certainly seems that there's lots uh, for us to do. Uh, now let's move to some of the questions from the attendees. Our first question is from an anonymous attendee. So I, I cannot give credit uh, to that person. Uh, and they're uh, thanking you for the presentation, asking you uh, whether, uh, uh, how according to you, more inter interpretivist and constructivist studies could contribute to this stream of literature. I, I think Margaret already started talking about the qualitative studies. Uh, the reason why I focus so much on quantitative and latent curve growth modeling and things like this is because if we take it from other literatures, this is what they have been doing. Um, though the organizational newcomer literature has also lately started to look mm -hmm. at um, how processes develop through a qualitative methodology. And I've read recently an excellent study. Um, it's not a new study by Molinsky, I think it was 2013, about cultural retooling. And yeah. it is how expatriates develop um, behaviors and changes in those behaviors. And that, that is an excellent um, qualitative study. That yeah, can, that's, that's a fantastic study. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Dave Thomas, who uh, is asking uh, to hear your thoughts on adjustment as it relates to performance and other important variables. So we've talked about adjustment as a construct, adjustment as a process. Uh, think about adjustment in its nomological network and adjustment in, and performance in particular has been an issue that has occupied us as a field for a very long time. So um, what are your sort of new inspired thoughts based on this very extensive review that you did? Does it matter? for performance or it just matters in its own right? Oh, I think adjustment is important, not only in its own right, but it, it does have implications for not only the performance of the individuals, but for organizational performance as well. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, I think there have been some studies, a few that have looked at that link between what we refer to as the state of adjustment and performance, and there is support for that. It would be interesting to really get into that, into that, uh, those relationships more, and understand some of the underlying mechanisms. Just how does adjustment play out in and lead to better performance? Okay, Michaela, any anything to add? In terms of studying performance, we think of it as an outcome of adjustment, but that, that link is not very well supported so far. And we study changes in adjustment um, should lead to changes in performance if we talk about work adjustment. So we do definitely need more in this regard, and not just performance, but also other outcomes, such as job satisfaction and everything else that could stem from adjustment on, or be interrelated. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're just making all of this more complicated because to get <laughs> good measures of performance, you have to have supervisor ratings or something from the organizational database about performance. So we're asking people not only to answer surveys over time, but we also want to get them from multiple stakeholders. So I realize what we're suggesting is not um, it is challenging. Let me put it that way. 
Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. It's sort of the the, the investment in, in time and getting companies on board and yes. getting people to devote their time and attention to the study. It's certainly not for the weak hearted, yes. uh, the study of, of adjustment. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, I'm going to try to combine two questions here, perhaps not very successfully. So apologies to uh, Vlad Weiman and, and Elaine if I butcher your question. But they're both asking about context and the yeah. role of context. So a lot of the uh, research on adjustment has been a bit context free. You know, you're just adjusting to this thing. Uh, so what is the role of context uh, generally in adjustment? And Vlad was specifically talking about the role of various country level entities like governmental, public private collaborations that may be helpful for adjustment. Any thoughts on that? So we we have looked a bit more into context and it is essential. Um, the context within which expatriates have to adjust is essential. So this proactive behaviors on their side to try to adjust are in an interaction with the context, whether this is mm -hmm. social actors in the organization, social actors outside of the organization, including institutions and country level institutions. Um, and from what I mentioned from the organizational newcomer literature, they focus a lot on how the organization socializes newcomers mm -hmm. in terms of practices to bring them into the fold, so to say, to make them into organizational insiders. But we don't know that much of what institutions in the country do mm -hmm. to socialize and to integrate and to help foreign employees adjust and how the foreign employees react to this. So we need more studies on this and it is the context is essential you cannot adjust in a vacuum. You do not adjust to a vacuum. You adjust to a context. Yeah. And, uh, and Ma uh, sorry, just Marion Festing, just because it is an add-on to this, is talking about the fact that the origin of the of the of the employee might matter as well. Sort of at the individual yeah. level, the country of origin might uh, be relevant as well. Mm -hmm. I was just going to comment on that. So Marion and I are on the same wavelength here. Um, I think one thing that would be interesting to look at is uh, expatriates who are coming from a tight culture going into a loose culture. Mm -hmm. They need different proactive behaviors, and they may not have those already at hand um, because they would not necessarily be effective in another tight culture or in their home tight culture. Or if they're going from a loose culture into a tight culture, um, that's going to affect their behaviors as well. So how do they modify those behaviors um, so that they're appropriate for the cultural context that they're in? And we also have to recognize discrimination as well of, of foreign employees from countries that are not wanted in another country or um, gender issues. So all of this plays a role in terms of what uh, background they have. Yeah, I mean, this becomes a whole other ballgame once we start talking about immigrant yeah. employees and so forth. Yeah. But that's maybe a topic for another seminar because with only about 10 minutes left, we probably won't be able to tackle that, uh, but it's certainly something quite interesting because then these contextual variables really become mm -hmm. uh, very salient and relevant. Uh, now, if I zero back on expatriation, we have a question from uh, Mark Mendenhall himself, uh, who said that for the last little while, he's been focusing on global leadership, so hasn't quite kept up as much with the expat literature. But his question was, I'm wondering if there's been much work over the past 10 years or so that addresses the construct definition of expatriation itself. So kind of a broader question on expatriation. I know that's a very big question. So what is expatriation today? Thank you, Mark. That's a great yeah. question. <laughs> Well, we could go back to the Latin root, um, expatria, which means out of the parent country or the home country, is a very broad definition. But I think within the management literature, at least, we define it in terms of expatriate employees. So those individuals who leave a home country and relocate to a host country. 
given the recent pandemic that we've all been through, there has been some movement towards uh, focusing on virtual expatriates. So while they may not physically leave their home country, they still have responsibilities that are similar to the role that they would have as an expatriate in another country. Okay. But yeah, I think, anything? Yeah, I was just going to add that outside of the management literature, I think the term expatriate is often used interchangeably with sojourners as well. Yes. Um, so you will see that term. Uh, and I noticed that, you know, when you were talking about your new AMR paper, you know, so you talk about adaptation, you know, one question that pops up frequently is, are they distinct constructs or are they the same construct? Would you like to enlighten us on this? <laughs> I know everyone talks about, or oftentimes people use acculturation, adaptation, and adjustment sort of interchangeably, mm. but we would see them as being different. So acculturation is more the process of change, whereas adaptation has to do with the fitting in. It's more behavioral in nature. And I could see our con concept of adjustment um, from both a process and a static point of view, fitting in with both of those approaches. I see. Well, I, I'm going to watch the recording because I started taking notes and it's, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. Uh, we also had an interesting question on uh, doing research on this. Um, uh, many, uh, pretty much every study that reviews things these days ends up with saying time is ripe for. Um, interdisciplinary research, mm -hmm. right? And in a way, you, you you touch upon a sort of not a different discipline, perhaps, but, you know, to, talking about uh, newcomers literature. But what are your thoughts of how uh, the how the study of exploitation can, and, and adjustment in particular, can benefit from interdisciplinary study? What opportunities do, do you see there? Well, I mentioned already in terms of bringing in the organizational behavior literature, which when it doesn't seem like it is far removed because the original Black et al. model actually was based to an extent on the organizational newcomer literature. We have diverged so far that when we worked on this project with our colleague who's from that area, it took us a while to understand that we're not speaking about the same thing when we were talking about something. That a while was like months. <laughs> Um, so even for me personally, the challenge I see, and I, I think there is a lot of value in interdisciplinary research, is actually being able to talk to each other, um, being able to understand first that there are differences between the literatures and how to reconcile those. That process takes a long time. Um, and then when we think about how other literatures can contribute to literature and expatriation, I think we also have to think the other way around. There is a lot that in international business in general, we bring in from other areas, uh, but organizational behavior strategy doesn't bring in that much from international business. Yeah, but I'm thinking more like sociology or yeah. health sciences or, you know, kind of when, when you not not so much within uh, OB management or HR, but kind of thinking really far out there, you know, mm -hmm. or political scientists, you know, when you start talking about macro factors, then that becomes really, really relevant. Uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on the on the chat here, and I'm not sure our attendees can see the things that are getting posted in the Q&A. Uh, so just to kind of continue that thought on the on the types of expatriation. So uh, Alan Engel uh, suggested uh, that we look at Yvonne McNulty and Chris Brewster's piece in 2017 on the on uh, the notion of expatriate. So uh, if, yeah. if you guys can't see that, that's a uh, that's a piece that I thought um, that I thought I would uh, I would share. Uh, we have uh, five um, five more uh, minutes here. Uh, if uh, and you know there's still uh, and we'll we'll share all the questions with you because we can't possibly uh, get through all of them. Um, I was wondering is uh, you know in uh, if we were to have this ten years from now, right? We reconvene to say what is what has happened in the world and how have people taken on your advice? What's the type of studies you hope you'll be able to report on uh, in in a in a decade's time? 
do you think that research will happen? And, you know, what do you hope to see? I think it will happen. I think that we're going to see more um, diary studies. Okay. Um, because now we have the technology that really facilitates that. Um, so I, I can see progress in that area. I think it's going to continue to be a challenge, though, to um, find expatriates before they leave the home country and track them after they leave. I mean, ideally, we would be able to do that so we can learn more about what happens before their assignment and then as they go through that transition and and throughout the duration of their assignment even. But I think that's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe with qualitative approach, we can learn more about that process. Um, might be easier. So we spent a lot of time talking about research, right? This is the essence of our of our webinar. But what can we tell practitioners uh, about adjustment? So Miguel was asking a question of whether you're aware of a company that's a best practice company when it comes to supporting their expats and adjustment. So um, either tell us something about that if you have an example there, or if not, what can we advise organizations? Because people's uh, well-being is at stake. Well, I, I don't know an example of a company that does a very good job, not because they don't, it's just I don't know it. Uh, but in approaching companies for the other study I was talking about, uh, the other problem I had was that companies tended to say, we support our expatriates, we train them, and we provide them with good support during the assignment. We don't need this study. So I have a feeling that companies are not doing enough based on this interaction. I think they're not recognizing the multitude of factors that they need to keep in mind in terms of expatriation, that it is not just about training and whether mm -hmm. expatriates are satisfied with this training or not, that they need to go beyond this in terms of support and really recognizing the adjustment as a process that they can't at one point provide support and that this is enough, that it is a process. Okay. And I think I think we need to do a better job as researchers to try to bridge that gap between the scholars and the practitioners. So it really falls upon us to be able to try to present our research to them in a way that they will benefit from it. And yeah. that goes back to the question about um, the link between adjustment and performance. You know, so even yes. finding out inf more information about that topic would help us be more persuasive in getting them on board. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for such an inspiring presentation and for getting our brains to think about the next research question, the next study, the next collaboration. This was truly insightful. And if I have one criticism, there was too much of it. So uh, I will have to <laughs> review my notes uh, at the end of this and chart uh, path forward for the next 10 years or so, because there certainly seem to be enough questions uh, that we can tackle. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to our audience. Before we break for today, just a couple of announcements. The webinar series is continuing. Our next one won't happen until January, where uh, Yvonne, who we mentioned earlier, uh, will um, talk to us, uh, but she will not talk about expatriation. Uh, her uh, presentation would actually be on surviving challenging field work without losing your mind and soul. So this is more around research ethics and supporting the researcher behind the research project. So this won't happen for a couple of months, uh, but please sign up. Here's the QR code. Uh, and I believe uh, Kara may have uh, posted that uh, link in the chat there. So uh, please join us for that in January. Uh, another set of community announcements. First is you may, the news may have already reached you, but we will have another international HRM conference that will take place in London uh, at the end of June. See the announcement there in the chat. There is no dedicated website for this yet, but you can have a look at the call for papers and start planning a submission. So we hope to uh, have uh, some of these conversations face-to-face. -face. Finally, we're all looking forward to that. 
And my very last announcement again for the community is there will be a, a special issue of the Journal of World Business. I have put that in the chat, which is on the future of global work, uh, almost a year until we have to submit. Uh, but now that we've got all these great ideas, uh, I would say uh, go to you uh, to open open up a Word file and start working. So we look forward to your submissions uh, next September. And with that, we're past time. Uh, let me once again thank our presenters. Let me thank all of my colleagues. Uh, and I regret not saying their names at the beginning, so I will do so now. Uh, Miguel Olivas, uh, Maral Muradbekova, Marion Festing, Maya Vidovich, Lynn Farndale, and behind the scenes, Cara uh, and Gerardo. Thank you, everybody, for making this a, such a wonderful initiative to be a part of. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely evening. And we will see you in January. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.